standing training and ran a cut on the T point to drive home, he would not be. The board distracted, the board does not stop going to the education goals. And that's my long term concern. How is this dissatisfaction impacting today's students and tomorrow's students? In your opinion. You guys all hear that? Okay. The question is, given the current status, the dissatisfaction with the funding, please tell me if I misrepresent it, I'll try hard not. Uh, the dissatisfaction with the funding formula within a number of the communities, what impact does that have on the educational <coughs> programming, the education of the students? And I'm going to turn what you said just a little bit and say, and the functioning of this Board of Education and its ability to address educational, significant educational issues. Uh, that, I'm going to take that one first because that's probably the easiest to answer. If you're caught up in issues regarding litigation, school funding, anything that's going to take you away from the educational mission as the Board, it's going to distract and take your time away from other items that perhaps you should be focused on. No question about that. Um, we have situations where one board member will file an ethics complaint against another board member. It's a little bit different, but it's divisive. It creates, you know, friction. It takes time and emotion away. In a way, you can have that same kind of sort of <coughs> What impact does that have on your decision making? I mean, you get a series of votes that cut along the lines of the communities and their feelings about cost apportionment. I don't know. I don't have that sense, but I'm seeing two people shaking their heads no. That's a good thing. Because it says to me, you can you put that aside and you're able to function as a board and, and address issues in terms of the kids. Um, as far as the impact in the classroom, my sense would be, my daughter's 28, my son's 22. Um, my daughter's a teacher, she's in her seventh year, my son's going back for his math certification. My wife's, we're, we're an education family. When they were students, I'm not sure what happened at this level really trickled down to them in the question. Uh, they got interested in things the Board of Education was doing, if they were going to cut money to the marching band, or, you know, they couldn't go to a particular program, or there's, you know, there's no snow day, or whatever it may be. Those kind of things that affected them. But I think day to day, I don't think it hits them that hard. Now, as far as staff in the building, as far as administration, as far as implementing board goals, depends how good your administration is. I would think that, uh, I know of, of to be peaceful, that he would, I'm sure he's handling as well as he can. I'm sure that the district is not, well, I'm sure the district is not negatively impacted by the community discussion. Okay. I thought that would be my, would you want to speak to that? I mean, I, no, you don't want to speak to that. Okay, that's fine. But I would tend to think that kids, kids are pretty resilient. Now, unless you start to get into a situation where and I've seen it in some communities where now the kids come to the board meeting, usually that's when the football coach gets fired. Right? <laughs> but if they start coming out and start talking about this, I mean, I'm not sure it hits them just yet. I'm not sure it hits my kids who are 28 and 22. I mean, I start, I start talking about stuff like this and they fall asleep. So. <laughs> and I don't mean that to, you know, to be facetious or frivolous or anything. I don't think it gets to them. The issue would be is what happens here and the disruption to this these meetings. <coughs> Does it then impact what administration can do? Because maybe some of their ideas aren't considered or aren't considered as well as they might otherwise be because we're distracted with some other issues. Yeah, that can happen. That can happen. I've seen districts where you know you get to situations where every vote is five four. It doesn't matter what it is, it's five four. Because that's just the way it falls out. It doesn't sound like that's what you guys do. And that's, uh, that's a credit to all of you and the administration to keep that through, through development. But could it be a distraction, sure? 
I was taking a different direction and okay. asked another question. Um, it's all the talk about shared services in the state. Combining uh, what would be the financial impact if we were to go in the opposite direction of one one eight twelve encompassing all the KDAs and the and the wet Mars we build. What would you think about that? That's it's an interesting question. We really have to look at will there be We've got two high schools. Would there be some economy of scale? Um, maybe. I mean, I'll throw a hypothetical out. About a year ago, we have a personnel administrators group that meets, and it's human resources people, and they meet by month. Gentleman from Montclair by the name of Jim Patterson came in and talked about ways in which, from a human resources perspective, you can save on staffing level. And one of the things he said, which was interesting, was that if you have a structure where buildings are grade related, in other words, you don't have three or four K to five buildings, but you have a K to two and three and four, and something, something like that, you have more flexibility in your staffing and you can probably save on some staff because instead of having, you know, uh, just come up with some numbers real quick. Three, class of 1922, I think it's 21 because that adds up easily important. And, uh, and 25. You've got 65 kids. Well, you probably don't want two classes of 32 to 33. So you don't want to go to two classes. But now you bring in a couple of more classes because you combine that together. Instead of having five sections, you may be able to do four and still keep the class size as reasonable to accomplish what you want to do. Because the numbers can work. Would that kind of economy of scale be available in an overall K-12 regional structure? Or even an overall K-8 regional structure? Yes. You could do certain things like that. At what cost? I've got some transportation issues in you're going to move kids to different places where you didn't move them before. Problem. I don't know. The, I don't know where the numbers fall, but it does give you an opportunity to try some more creative solutions. Are there financial incentives from the state? Is there encouraging this? Uh, no. Guess the answer. Simple answer is no. <laughs> there have. I will say this. There have been at different other times. None of them have really been significant enough to provide a lot of regionalization. Um, this is great, I'm working off memory now. On page two of your outline, I believe you see, you'll see a series of incentives towards regionalization under the TEA, under CEPA, chapter 212, before that, we really didn't see a lot of regionalization in the area of chapter 212. I think under, under chapter 212 was only one, in the chatham. We'll go back a little further. And there was, I think maybe it was under Man Culture Style of Utah down in Burlington County. And then the only two under uh, the QEA and the CEPA, on the QEA rather, was Somerset Hills and, and uh, Great Meadows. Four in 30 years. So the, the numbers, the dollar amounts, the incentives really have been enough to drive them. I think the other factors too. Could they? I guess they could if they could find the money. I mean, the bigger the bigger issue right now for public sector is the municipalities, counties, school boards, and everybody's working with it. I guess or with it. The economy is off. People have lost their jobs. State revenue is down considerably. Considerably. It's, it's, it's an interesting, and I don't want to turn this into a funding formula, but it's an interesting demographic. When you start to look at the numbers, about 10% of the population in the state pays about 40% of the state income tax. About 20% pays 80% of the state income tax. And only about 50% of the state income tax revenue comes from payroll deductions. The other 50% comes from investments. That kind of income. So when, for example, Wall Street is down, 
and people aren't getting those bonuses and making that money, the state revenues are down. During the Wall Street crash, the recent one, state revenues went down about $2 billion. Wow. And so now you look back and you say, okay, oh, that's where the $2 billion went. That's the money that the billion dollars that we lost in public education. That's the billion dollars in Medicaid and all the other stuff. That's the $2 billion bailout from Washington, the stimulus money. I don't know the answer to that question. I have no idea how to answer that question. But it's, somebody has to come up with more than we've got to figure out how to create better jobs to be able to make it That's a big issue. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I went on tangent. Yes. This is just like a lot of stuff. About how do we really do the now? I mean, the of the I mean, the why that is not what people are thinking, why that doesn't work. Well, the, the, question, the, the question is how many. Uh, the assumption is there aren't that many districts that do a pure pupil allocation. And the question would be, is, why is that the case? And why doesn't it work? Or why hasn't it worked? I believe there are, see, I got to give you the number of well, I can tell you, those are the only two in the state. There's only two. The number of regional districts in the state, I believe, is in the high 50s. 